everyone, it's Melissa Peters here with Dorn Companies, coming to you pain-free live to help you live pain and injury-free. Thanks for tuning in today for another episode of the Injury Prevention Academy, where we feature experts who provide insight into topics related to pain management, ergonomics, injury prevention, with the goal of helping you support the safety and well-being of your employees. For over 20 years, Dorn has led the cutting edge of workplace safety solutions, offering holistic, proactive strategies to help organizations in all sectors reduce injuries, cut costs, and boost productivity. With an annual ROI of 600% and a reach of over 100,000 employees, we've saved employers over $100 million in workers' compensation and healthcare cost and claims. Joining us today is Dr. Tony Hall, the president and founder of Instinctive Movement System. Dr. Hall's background is in human performance and rehabilitation. After spending years training and rehabilitating high-level athletes and injured workers alike, Dr. Tony took the best, me best methodologies from performance science and developed a scalable program for training the industrial athlete. He has spoken at many conferences where he educates safety personnel and other clinicians on clinical biomechanics and industrial injuries. So thank you, Dr. Tony, for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me, Melissa. Yes, I am very excited to have a very uh, good discussion about biomechanics and industrial athletes today. So to jump into that, um, I was doing some reading and it turns out that every seven seconds a worker is injured on the job, which results in seven million work injuries every year according to the National Safety Council. So these numbers are quite staggering. And when you look at it, a lot of them have preventable variables involved. So what are some important factors and strategies that safety leaders and professionals need to consider when creating an injury prevention program? Uh, one of the biggest things, and I noticed this uh, right away, you know, when I started doing more on-site visits at different industries, manufacturing, even offices, and and started really paying attention to what the safety world is doing, they've, they've made so many strides and improvements in the last, you know, a few decades in safety and injury prevention, and, and they've got some some statistics to back it up, but musculoskeletal injuries, non-traumatic, is something that, that hasn't been as greatly affected. Um, safety done a great job with traumatic injuries, with all the safety training they do, with uh, working from heights, closed spaces, um, tag in, tag out type of, type of training and whatnot, but non-traumatic injuries. You know, not everybody injures their back or shoulder or knees from falling off a third story building. Um, these injuries can happen slowly. And the biggest thing I noticed that safety personnel need to change is simple verbal and visual cueing does not change behaviors. A lot of people know, the safety people know, it's like, hey, you know, people do bad lifting, they hurt their back, they hurt their shoulders when they push improperly. Well, improper body mechanics, are not done because of somebody's conscious lack of thinking about safety. It's because they have dysfunctional behaviors and asymmetries in their body, so they don't do it on purpose. So you telling them to lift with their legs, for example, and having a bunch of posters of people lifting properly does not change behaviors. You need to do something else. Absolutely. and. Um... Ironically enough, I'm about to pull up a couple of posters as we dive in to the next topic, because um, as I mentioned, I know that you've uh, developed the instinctive movement system. And when we look at um, what's involved with that, I know it takes us outside of what might be involved in a traditional stretch and flex program. So can you speak to some of the pitfalls of traditional programs that are out there and why it's important to take that further into mobility and conditioning? Okay, with traditional stretch and flex, which is oftentimes what we did when we were kids in school, they call it static stretching. And it's not necessarily bad, 
it's just not real effective. There's tons and tons of data and research in the human form performance world that shows that static stretching um, is has very short-lived benefits. You know, you do some static stretching, you might stretch a certain muscle for a number of minutes. And when you di do dynamic movements, your, fl your increased flexibility lasts a lot longer. And uh, it's not just about that. It's also about traditional stretch and flex says, well, I strain my neck at work a lot, so I need to stretch my neck. I strain my back at work, or my employees strain their back at work or their knees at work, so we need to stretch that. I injure my shoulders a lot at this company, so we need to stretch our shoulders more. No, couldn't be further from the truth. A lot of times you have an injured joint, whether it be a knee, a shoulder, or back. You don't need to stretch it. You need to stabilize it and also re remove the overloading mechanism or the behavior that's causing the joint or tendon to be overloaded. So you don't just stretch something because it hurts. You stretch something because the muscle is shortened and it needs to be lengthened. So when I teach clinicians, you know, like I'm teaching doctors, industrial injuries, clinical biomechanics, I go, as a clinician, you need to hold the bar higher. And you don't give somebody stretches just because that part of their body hurts. Know, your, know why you're stretching something and um, and how are you doing it? So not I'm not poo-pooing stretching because I'm a huge flexibility person, but stretch the right part at the right time and most importantly for the right reason. That's fascinating because I think I I can relate to that being a a natural thing to be like oh I'm about to go for a run I should just start doing lunges left and right or I should start doing this so I think taking that a step further to really understanding um how you're moving your body and what the implications are that I think that's very fascinating. Um, I know that at Dorn, so we actually, um, as you know, we um, are proponents of the instinctive movement system and we actually got a chance to use it with a major airline client of ours and we saw tremendous results uh, in their ability to learn how to use their body properly. We saw that with useful reinforcement of the proper techniques they were able to retain it up to 96 percent even six months later um, and in combination with our therapy program we took them from usually a two to two and a half percent claim rate to zero claims for the folks who went through the program so can you speak to to how it really works to change behavior and right. even some of the experiences of your own clients yes doing stretches and doing exercise as a warm up does not prevent injuries in and of itself. What prevents injuries is changing asymmetries, dysfunctional movements, bad behaviors. When I say bad behavior, I don't mean conscious. I'm talking about subconscious behaviors. If I take a room of 10 workers or if I'm in the gym with 10 junior high kids and teaching them weightlifting, I'm going to see 10 different squats like on the posters there, I'm gonna see 10 different deadlifts and 10 different torso rotations. So it's not doing the deadlift that prevents injuries. It's doing a very good quality movement and then correcting any asymmetry somebody has. So you have to break the movements down into little pieces, correct how they do it with a lot of different methodologies. You correct the asymmetries and balances people have. And now when they move differently, people are like, wow, that feels good. I don't feel that in my back now. I feel it in my butt and thighs. I go, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. I, I, it's simple. I wanna make people's knees, shoulders, and backs feel better. So we're gonna work the large muscles of the body and give those joints and tendons a break. And it's about correcting asymmetries and imbalance. So doing exercises, you're just blindly doing them because when I worked at the medical center, a lot of the family practice docs would come by me and say, hey, Tony, I hear all these good things from all my patients. They come see you and you give them these little exercises. Can I have that sheet of exercises? Sure, here you go, but it's not gonna work. I have to correct the, the dysfunctions they have and asymmetries and then doing those exercises will help. Now, some people can do these exercises perfect. I don't worry about them, but a lot of people can't. So we break the movements down, correct the asymmetries and balances, which in the safety world, they call them behaviors. In the, in the performance science world, we call them motor function or motor engrams or movement behaviors. Okay. To make a, to make a 
a, a long a long answer even longer there you go okay no that was great and i heard in there this idea that people can start feeling the difference in their bodies as they learn the proper way of movement so when you come across these improper body mechanics and dysfunctional movements what kind of injuries do you see most frequently you know i see all of them you know literally all of them but the, the big three are definitely shoulders knees and backs and each industry is different i train people in industries all over and, and about every industry you can imagine and and some industries definitely have their nuances and their and their problems um, but definitely the knees, shoulders, and backs, but wrist, elbows. And, and for instance, a lot of places I go, if they have a lot of what I call upper quarter injuries, shoulders, wrist, elbows, a lot of those injuries come from dysfunction in the hips. So if people don't use their hips properly, they have a tendency to overload the wrist, elbows, and shoulders. Okay, so once you do that, then you end up with too much strain on your wrist rather than using that proper way of hip movement to help support the full fluid movement. Yeah, and it and happens is the joints and tendons oftentimes wear out slowly. So especially in an aging workforce, um, they start hurting, having aches and pains, the joints and tendons are getting beat up and it takes a long time. You don't necessarily have a ton of pain and then all of a sudden, uh, one day something blows out and say, oh, it must have been from this. No, it's been going on for a really, really long time. And, uh, and, and it's hard to sometimes pinpoint exactly what the cause was. So when it comes to these kind of programs, I think anyone out there um, who watches sports or has played a sport, we're familiar with the idea that you need to condition your body in order to be prepared for that level of physicality. We sometimes forget that there's people out there in the manufacturing industry and other types of industries who also are using their body in very, you know, rigorous ways throughout the day. So can you speak to what an industrial athlete is and what it means when you start to view your workers as industrial athletes? Yes, that's a great question. It's probably one of the most important topics I have when I speak all over. To, to different industries just on clinical biomechanics and industrial injuries. What it is is, and the mistake that most people make, whether it be the, the it's not, I'm not gonna blame the HR department, the safety <laughs> department, because it's everybody, it's just human um, natural instinct. They think, okay, I need to exercise, I need to get in shape, I do a hard job, or I sit in an office all day, so I need to do more. So they think, okay, I need to get my muscles stronger, I need to be more flexible. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You need to learn how to move first. It's the foundations of movement. So you need to learn how to move your body first, like a baby, learn to roll over, the baby learn to crawl, the baby learn to stand up. We don't take a baby and teach them how to do deadlifts and how to do uh, power cleans and how to sprint and, and run a marathon. So people oftentimes make the mistake of trying to get their body in shape and now they have bad movements, so they actually injure themselves or hurt themselves or get burnt out because they're trying to get their body in shape where they need to learn how to move first. So I call it wake up the nervous system. When I say pre-shift warm up, what you're doing is you're waking up the nervous system, you're correcting imbalances, you're waking up the large muscles of your body, and that's what gives the tendons and joints a little break so you move better. And then later on, comes the flexibility, the strength, the, the endurance, the cardiovascular. But first, you need to wake up the nervous system, correct the asymmetries, and then comes the what I call the fitness aspect. Okay, so when we're looking at industries that you work with most often, um, what industries would you say it's important for you know the safety leaders in hr to really adopt this industrial athlete mind frame well i i work with um, all industries literally i'm i i can't pick one i i, I do oh. manufacturing a lot of drivers construction law enforcement firefighters office personnel administration um light assembly um, I got people that lift heavy things all day and people that stare in a microscope all day. Okay. Um, so I see everything. And the biggest thing you need to do is 
the idea of a stretch and flex or pre-shift warm-up is great, but really, really break it down. Look at the foundations and look at correcting asymmetries, imbalances in the body, looking at quality of movement. We live in a world that's data-driven, right? And, 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 and human performance and science is that way too. And so a lot of people say, um, I'll go to different industry and different lectures I give. They'll say, well, at this job, they got to lift 50 pounds or they got to lift the 75 pounds. Well, that's good to know, but I care more how they lift that 75 pounds. A lot of people look, well, can they lift 75 pounds? No, I, I care how they do it. And so it's more qualitative. It's not just quantitative. I mean, quantitative is great, but we, we, we have to put quantitative data to qualitative measurements like in, in when it comes to human movement. Absolutely. Um, coming from a social science background, I'm a fan of mixed methodology myself. So um, there you go. I, heard you, I heard you mention office workers, and I think sometimes there's a misconception about the strain that sitting and being, you know, a desktop office worker can do. And a lot of times it's like, oh, just buy an ergonomic chair. Um, so can you speak to how this importance of movement translates out into the office worker and setting as well? Yes, my favorite topic is I, it, it's easy just to sell a chair. Um, and, and a good chair is better than a bad chair. A, a stand up desk and, and standing up, sitting down, change of position all the time is great. But one of my favorite sayings is it's not about the chair. Okay. I can take a, a yoga instructor and have them sit in a card table all day long and they'll be fine. I take somebody really deconditioned, their body's beat up. I'll put them in a thousand dollar office chair and they're going to still feel lousy at the end of the day. So it's about when you, when you office personnel, they sit all day, they develop huge imbalances, lots of muscles in their body completely shut down. It has nothing to do with strength. The nervous system actually starts to shut them down. We call it inhibited. And when you stay in, stand in one spot, sit in one spot, the tendons and joints are overloaded. They start to break down. So a lot of people look at my little exercise posters without having any, any uh, training or knowledge of them. They say, well, well, we sit all day, so I don't need to do any deadlift or squats. No, if you sit all day, you need to do them more than the guy who lifts and exercises and works hard all day. You need it more because your body's completely shut down. Now, I don't need you to go to the gym and do a bunch of heavy squats and do a bunch of heavy deadlifts. I just need you to move better, wake up those muscles that are shut down, give those tendons and joints a break. You don't need to go to the gym for two hours a day. You don't need to do a yoga for three hours a day. I just need you to take a couple minutes a day and wake up those muscles, okay? Wake up that nervous system and get the body moving better. And then when you move better, you sit better as well. So sitting is, is a dynamic thing. The more you active and exercise you do, the better you sit. Okay, definitely for all my fellow office workers out there. I hope you took note of that. Uh, so, Tony, I heard you. You, I heard the key word deconditioned. And right now, um, you know, we're in this strange time with uh, COVID, and people have had interruptions in work. Maybe are looking to go back, but it's been two, three months. Can you speak to this process of deconditioning and what workers and employers need to be mindful of as people are coming back from, you know, up to a three month break? Oh yeah, um, don't overdo it. Develop a plan, develop a strategy in front of your computer, at your desk, have a little sign there, have a picture where you make yourself take a break for 60 seconds every half hour, every hour, and do a few movement drills. Uh, twice a day, go for a little 10 minute, real, real vigorous walk. Um, I have a great LinkedIn video under Instinctive Movement System where it shows if you're an office worker, one of the best things you can do is just change how you get out of the chair when you get up and down. Because even if you sit at home all day in the chair, you still get up and down frequently. And if you turn that getting up and out of, out of the chair when you're at home all day into a little glute workout, when I say glute workout, I'm not talking about strengthening the muscles, tightening and toning. I'm talking about just waking up those muscles, giving those back, the disc in your back a break, giving those tendons in your shoulder and your neck a break and kind of waking up those big muscles. And you don't need to do a workout. I, I tell people just a, a few minutes a day or a little break for a minute here and there. but 
Um, failing to plan is planning to fail. So you have to have a plan. It has to be written down. You have to have some pictures and be well defined because then you'll follow through on it. Absolutely. So related to you know whether people are at home or not, um, I want to switch gears a little bit and just kind of wrap up with another aspect of what can be involved in injury prevention, which is the importance of hydration and nutrition. So can you just speak to how kind of a holistic method of what role hydration and nutrition play in injury prevention and, and wellness? Oh, absolutely. So you hear me talk about motor patterns and movement all the time. Okay. So when your blood sugar is crashing or up and down because your diet, you know, you got too much sugar, you don't have a, a, a stable diet or you're dehydrated, now fatigue sets in. And when fatigue sets in, now your movements, your behavior is going to be compounded. Now they're going to be really bad. So that's often how people injure themselves. Um, hydration, you know, with drivers is very important. And by the time you feel thirsty, you've already been dehydrated for a long time. And in a lot of parts of the country, people don't realize you not just, it's not just, you don't just dehydrate when you sweat and you're working out or exercising out in the sun. If you're in a really warm, dry climate, when you sleep at night, you're dehydrating for seven, eight, nine hours the whole time. So when you get up in the morning, you're already dehydrated. And now you drink a coffee or you race off to work. Now you're way dehydrated, okay? And that's not good for the body. You're gonna have poor movements, poor focus. Now you have both bad subconscious movement and bad conscious movement because your consciousness is way below where it should be. So yeah, nutrition and hydration, they both go hand in hand. Um, nutrition's more about the blood sugar levels and, and having a, a good diet and nutrition's all about, or hydration is um, you know self-explanatory. You gotta, you gotta get the electrolytes, you gotta get the fluids, you gotta have a, and you gotta have a plan. You gotta start pounding the water and the electrolytes right away in the morning because you're behind the eight ball when you get up in a lot of places. Absolutely. So to tie it all together, you've, you've given us so much great insight. Is there a major takeaway, just a, a brief thing for all the listeners and viewers out there, if they walk away with one thing from this uh, conversation, what do you want them to walk away knowing? Okay. Um, don't try to become a, how should I say it, a bodybuilder fitness expert right away. Just start in small pieces, okay? Um, well, how they say, um, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So just start with some good quality movement. Starts with getting up out of the chair, you know, doing a good squat. Um, look at correcting the imbalances. Um, start drinking 20 ounces of water and some electrolytes or getting some great healthy hydration drinks right away in the morning. Um, just make small changes. Back off on the sugars for your nutrition. So. Just make some small changes. Don't bite off too much. I like that advice a lot. It's always, you know, what is it? A, a journey of a thousand steps starts with a single one, right? <laughs> so um, thank you so much, Dr. Tony, for taking the time to chat with me today. I really appreciate you and to everyone out there who took time to listen. We hope you found this informative and useful. And I look forward to you tuning in again in, uh, soon for our next episode. Thank you, Dr. Tony. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody.